Hello, Internet. I'm Wingsum, and today I'm going to show you how I made this NES inspired shortcut keyboard. Let's get started. If you've never heard of a shortcut keyboard or macro pad before, it's basically an extra little keyboard that you can plug into your computer and when you press the keys on that little keyboard, it can execute longer commands such as force quitting or pasting without formatting. This basically all started for me when my partner gifted me a Wacom tablet for digital art a little while ago. I love working on it, but I always find myself needing to turn it every which way in order to get the stroke the way that I want it. So I wanted to make a little knob on the side for turning the canvas and zooming in and out. And then the project rapidly spiraled out of control as soon as I started drawing out my ideas. I started out originally trying to design a rectangular shortcut keyboard that was inspired by the colors and the shapes of the classic SNES console. But then after I made it, I just thought it looked kind of silly. So I transitioned into making a little console controller connected to a mini retro TV. Now the little TV with the screen in it is completely extra, but I just thought it looked so cute that I kept it. I also ended up going with the NES instead of the SNES because I like the red and black a little better, but I added an additional row of buttons on the right hand side. Because I learned from my circuitry hubris from the last project, the neon LED sign, I worked out the circuit before buying all of the parts and making the physical case so that I know that it's all feasible to fit. You can access all the files related to this project in the GitHub linked below, or you can just take a quick screenshot right now. Having planned my circuit, I went on a little out of fruit shopping spree. I'm not sponsored or anything, I just love their whole deal. I got a tester set of mechanical keys to see which feel I like best. Each of these keys has a different force profile, so when you press on it, you get anything from smooth to clicky. I ended up liking the brown mechanical key best. It still has a tactile click without making the actual clicking noise. These pins on the bottom here will slot into this here key matrix. I got this because it's a great way to manage a bunch of keys set up in a grid. It'll help eliminate a couple of instances of soldering and it will give all of my keys a cheeky underglow via these NeoPixel LEDs you see here. And back on the other side of this board, you'll see that there's a couple of these little slots, and that's where those pins that I pointed out on the mechanical key insert. For running all the code to interface the keys with the actual software I'm using on my computer and get those shortcuts happening, I'm using an Adafruit Feather, which is a microchip with a breakout board. It's got a USB-C port, which I love, and the chip is a Raspberry Pi RP2040, which lets us use a bunch of CircuitPython modules that will make life way easier. Finally, I got this cable here that connects the OLED screen I got to the chip. This little guy here is the rotary encoder. It is both a rotary encoder and a push button. Plus, this friend comes with its own handy dandy little hex nut for securing it in place. The face of the part that this goes on will go in here between this washer and the electronic bits. Because it is super delightful to use, I also got this fancy machined metal knob to put on top of the encoder. It's held in place with a set screw and it has a rubber grip that comes with it, but I haven't decided whether or not I'm going to use it. Finally, Here's the OLED screen I got because every retro console needs its own crappy little TV to connect with. I think the cable I got to connect with the Adafruit Feather can actually plug into either of these ports here. We'll have to test later. Now for easy prototyping, I'm going to solder a bunch of these header pins into the feather. I'm pretty sure I'm going to need to rewire things as I'm testing with jumper wires and using the header pins makes things a lot easier. This is a hot tip that I got from an electrical engineer once, which is that you can keep all of your header pins in place by inserting them into your PCB, just like this, and then very carefully, uh, there we go, very carefully putting it inside of a solderless breadboard. It really keeps it all together just a little better than hands, even though it's a little fiddly to get in at first. 
By the way, for those of you who watched both the LED sign video and this one, I'd love to know how useful the technical information I include is. Should I include more? Should I just skip over it and go to the pretty bits? Please let me know your feedback down in the comments, it's really helpful. Soft cut to after I've jumper wired everything together, please excuse the mess, I wrote a bit of test code that had print statements corresponding to each button and encoder input to test and make sure that this circuit does indeed work before I start designing physical goods around it. The encoder goes up and down, and all the buttons respond to being pressed. With the circuit confirmed viable, it's time to do some 3D modeling. Unfortunately, my computer won't do Fusion 360, the CAD software, and screen recording at the same time, so we're going to make do with some screenshots. First, I modeled all the PCBs in as guides for size limits. You can see I'm planning on using three sections of the Snap Apart Key Matrix to place those NES keys. I've added in standoffs to keep room for wires underneath the PCBs, and I also added in some keys. I found this model for the mechanical keys on GrabCAD, it's by Kevin Yu, and I've linked it below. With all of the electrical parts catted in, I built a case up around all of them, and I included a hole for the USB-C as well as ridges that you can see along the top for sliding on a lid. This here is the lid, and it includes that black design that is also on the NES controller. Finally, I modeled in all of the custom keycaps that I'm going to build. Time to do some test prints. Y'all, I made so many failed prints, but here are just a few highlights. After testing many, many iterations of the keycaps, I finally arrived on one that would actually fit with the keys that I have and stay relatively secure. I also came to the conclusion that perhaps the original design was a little bit too large. So I've moved all the PCBs closer together. I also fixed the lid dimensions and made the whole thing a little shorter. And I also made the little TV smaller and made it so it's only got one button instead of three. After all those test prints and my big redesign, it's time to make the final parts. I'm using a stereolithography or SLA printer. I'll briefly explain how it works, but you can definitely find more in-depth explanations online. The printer I'm using has a tray of liquid resin at the bottom. The print bed starts in the resin and starts to move upwards as each layer of the print is set into place. Then basically at the end you get this part that's hanging from the print bed with a bunch of supports. In SLA printing, the resin gets set into place using a laser. For this particular printer, they're bouncing a laser off of a mirror below the print tray and that mirror is able to move around in the XY plane in order to focus the laser at the point that needs to be cured. I'm using an SLA printer for a couple of reasons. For one, it prints out these really lovely high resolution parts and oftentimes you can get a pretty smooth finish right out of the printer. It also gives me a couple more options for the material properties of the print, which is great because I'm trying to make a more durable part for this desktop device. When the parts are complete, there is a bunch of support material holding it up. So I loosened the supports and I broke them off. Now please enjoy a few moments of workshop ASMR. Having brought all the parts home, I'm now realizing that making the whole thing smaller means that I no longer have room for the header pins, which means I need to painstakingly heat up the solder and remove all the headers that I soldered in just a few days ago. I was hoping I'd only have to yank out the headers on the feather, but with the overlapping PCBs and now that all the standoffs are in, it's looking like I'll need to yank out the ones on the key matrix PCBs as well. Time for several hours of desoldering and resoldering. 
At this point in the process, I'm kind of suffering because I only have a thicker gauge wire at home, so bending everything into place was challenging. I could have thought ahead and ordered thinner wires for this project, but alas, here I am. I have these little legs for the retro TV, which I'm keeping in place with 1.6mm screws. In retrospect, I should have just glued them in place, because at this point I had to stop filming, since it's bad both for viewing pleasure and my dignity to include 20 minutes of me struggling to hold 1.6mm screws in place inside this very small model TV. Now before I close this case, I am going to finish up the software and verify that both the software works and the soldering I did was good. I find screen recordings of text editors to be kind of boring, so I'm going to skip the full software explanation in this video. Please let me know in the comments below if you would rather I include the full explanation for future videos. You can always find the whole operational code on the GitHub repo linked in the description. I'm making use of CircuitPython, keypad tutorials from Adafruit, and the Adafruit HID key code module. Now that I've finished the code and tested it and made sure all the soldering in the code works, I'm finally confident enough to put the lid on this thing. You can see this ridge here on the lid. Uh, it keeps getting stuck on the mechanical keys, so I'm using this handy scotch tape and tearing up smaller pieces of it like this to just kind of stick down the keys and uh, keep them in place, keep them from getting stuck on that lid. To be honest with you, I hadn't really thought about this problem when I designed the original lid. I think looking back, I probably would have made it so the lid just pops on top instead of sliding. Uh, okay, here we go. I hope this fits, it's a little bit snug. Uh... Yeah, I'm wishing that I had left a little extra space between the lid and the body because this is uh, pretty difficult to slide on like this. Um, yeah, something to definitely think about in my next project. Please work. <laughs> Alright, success. Lid is on. I have my tweezers here. I'm just gonna yank out these pieces of tape, just like that. Oh, oh, a spider's here. All right, approaching the finish line, which means it's time to pop in those keys. Those four nubs on the bottom there are gonna fit into each mechanical key and hold the key cap in place.
I can't believe I was ever going to use hardware here for these holes instead of just using hot glue. Way easier to use hot glue. Hot glue's the best. Time to peel off the film. Here we go. Nice. Now I'm gonna show you how this thing works. As you can see here, I have my favorite drawing program open. It's called Clip Studio Paint. And I wanna use my shortcut keyboard with this. However, I have it set to PowerPoint mode right now. So first I'm gonna switch it over to Clip Studio mode by switching the switch on the back to switch into switching mode, switching to Clip Studio. You can see the lights actually change colors to match the program that it's in. And then locking it in by clicking the, the, the switch on the back again. Now that I've got it in Clip Studio, it does all the functions that I want for it to do in Clip Studio. So the original thing that I made this thing for was to be able to easily, for example, zoom in and zoom out on my canvas. So if I want to do more fine detail work, zoom in and then zoom back out. Um, and then I also wanted to have a knob to rotate the canvas around because when I draw traditionally with a paper and pencil, I like to flip the canvas around every which way. So to do that, I press in on the knob and then it switches to rotation mode. And now you can see it rotates back and forth, which is very exciting. Um, it also can do all kinds of shortcuts that you would normally associate with multiple key presses on your keyboard. So for example, in Clip Studio, the function to go up and down a layer is uh, two buttons, but now I have it mapped to just the up and down on the D-pad. And then I also have, uh, of course, the classic, oops, made a mistake moment. You can do a little undo, and then maybe I do actually want to keep it, so then I do a little redo. And there you have it, the completed NES shortcut keyboard. At the end of every project, I like to reflect on the different lessons that I learned while completing it. I learned quite a few doing this one. For one, you should always, always do a bunch of test prints, especially for tight fitting parts. I really wish I had done more with the lid. Number two, and you really think I would have learned this by now, but it's to plan ahead and buy the appropriate wires for the project that you're doing. Number three is that sometimes you actually don't need to use hardware especially for things that aren't going to be put under a lot of force or anything. You can probably get away with hot glue, and hot glue is often much easier than hardware. Finally, use a larger drop cloth or piece of paper for your spray painting. Otherwise, you'll be like me and you'll end up with paint on things you'd rather not have paint on. Friends, thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions for me, please leave them in the comments below. I'll try to get back to you. And if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more, make sure to like and subscribe. I'll see you guys soon. Bye. Good morning, Moose. What do you think? Should I get a camera stabilizer? Make my video a little smoother?